Welcome all, and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Marcel Essling, and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional owners, sorry, the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. In this session, we will investigate how to get the most out of biological sprays for botrytis control. If you would like to provide a comment through the webinar or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send. We'll be holding the audience Q&A session at the end of this presentation but feel free to send in your questions at any stage. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and you'll be emailed a link to view the recording on the AWRI's YouTube channel. For anyone who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is getting the most out of biological sprays for botrytis control. It is a great pleasure to welcome Scott Patton from Nutrient Ag Solutions. Scott is going to present a general overview of how biologicals can play a role in controlling botrytis and then host a Q&A with our panel. On the panel, we have Hugh Armstrong from Bayer representing the product Serenade Opti, Mark Dix from BASF representing the product Serifel, and Matthew Gratton from New Farm representing the product Botecta. Hugh Armstrong is Strategic Marketing Lead for Horticulture for Australia and New Zealand. Hugh's role focuses on guiding the investment into new options for growers from Bayer's R&D pipeline. Prior to working for Bayer, you worked for a large wine company and also as an industry outreach coordinator. Our second panelist, Mark Dix, is a senior technical services specialist at BASF based in Albury, New South Wales. Mark is part of the Australia and New Zealand horticulture team and is the horticulture lead for Australia, covering all crop protection products, as well as biologicals, both covered and field crops. Mark's key focus is on new products and innovation in the horticultural sector. And finally, with more than 20 years of experience in the industry, Matthew Grattan is passionate about agriculture and horticulture and is committed to delivering long-term sustainable solutions to growers. Within Matthew's role at New Farm, he is responsible for the development of crop strategy for horticultural crops. Matthew leads new product development for horticulture products and provides solutions to identified grower needs. And first up, we're going to hear from Scott Patton. Scott Patton from Nutrient Ag Solutions is a product development ag agronomist focused on pest and disease management in a variety of horticulture crop segments. Crop has extensive, sorry, Scott has extensive experience in the use of biological fungicides for management of botrytis scenario in grapevines. He has worked on research for registration of biologically derived fungicides and assisted with grower adoption across various production zones from his base in Western Australia. Scott, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Marcel. I'll just share my screen. There we go. So the topic of discussion for today is biological fungicides for botrytis management. And I think this has been a subject that's been uh, raised several times over the past three, four years, where growers are a little bit skeptical about how to use the product successfully in a, a botrytis management program. Uh, and so today's discussion should be around uh, how we get the best out of those products that we have available to us and sort of demystifying, I guess, some of those variables that can influence the performance of biological fungicides. In my experience, the discussion generally starts with biological fungicides as to which product we should select and why that product is better than another. But when we're dealing with botrytis, um, our botrytis management program should be the first part of that conversation. Uh, we need to understand a range of different things around our botrytis in our particular zone, in our crop, in our varieties, and then work out 
way down the line which product selection and which combinations and which placement options uh, best fit for management of the disease in a given season. So I wanted to start the conversation today just talking specifically about botrytis management. So the things that we look at for botrytis management don't really change whether we're dealing with biological fungicides or more conventional mainstream options. So uh, we have four different scenarios that we have to deal with. So the first being disease uh, and conditions that favour the disease. So really understanding what we're trying to control. Uh, and Botrytis cinerea is a very different beast to many of the other pathogens that we deal with. Once we're familiar with the conditions that favour that disease and the, the nature of that disease, we then need to look at entry points or positions where we can establish primary or secondary infection. We then look at tool options that we can fit in to address those particular risks over the course of a season. And they can adapt between seasons depending on environmental conditions. And the other thing we need to deal with with botrytis management is correct layering of products. So not so much growth stage applications, but positioning products for their strengths against the environmental conditions you're growing under. So those four things are really important. I wanted to start with just a quick overview of botrytis uh, before we start dealing with the biological fungicides exclusively. So this table just shows you a, a basic run through of the various different windows where we have high pressure for specific diseases. And you can see when you look at the botrytis, the arbitrary figures or the growth stages we have um, high risk for the, the darker color in that table, show you that there are quite a diverse range of growth stages where we have high risk conditions um, for potential latent infection. So the discussion always starts off with we need a flowering spray and that flowering spray should be positioned somewhere between 60% catfall and 80% catfall. That's our standard botrytis window. But you can see in those in that graphic, there are quite a, a wide range of windows in which we can get botrytis setting late infection. And it's those sort of windows that we need to make sure that we're assessing risk in and positioning products to select um, ideal botrytis control. So we deal with the botrytis itself. It has a range of conditions that favours uh, active infection. So ideal conditions for spore release sit somewhere between 8 and 23 degrees in the presence of moisture, ideally. But those sort of conditions tend to be earlier in the season and moving up into flowering. And then we see them late season again. Um, surface moisture is an incredibly important part of this, and that can be due or um, moisture generated by high relative humidity in the canopy or on the berry surface or on the efflorescence. As we go through flowering, we have a very limited amount of moisture that's required in order to get spore um, activity and inoculation of the inflorescence. The longer we go through berry development, the, the greater uh, length of period of time needs to be in order to get effective um, colonization of the fruit. So with botrytis, we're dealing with a, a necrotroph, not an obligate biotroph. So it doesn't necessarily need green material to colonize like a powdery or a downy does. It's quite happy to colonize on any remnant plant material within the canopy, uh, flowering parts, caps that are stuck, a range of different positions. Um, if there are damage points from other pathogens, and we'll deal with this in a minute, but there are all sources of carbohydrates that are ideal for botrytis to really colonize and, and establish itself in the canopy. So we need to be looking a little bit more widely about how we can use the products we've got available to us to get effective control of latent infection as the season progresses um, based on, on, that, on that factor. Later season, you can also see direct entry into a cuticle that requires quite a lot of moisture over the surface of the berries uh, without an entry point. Uh, otherwise, entry point coverage is critical. So our botrytis window for control is quite broad. Our products that are available under more uh, conventional systems are narrowing, and we need to start thinking about how we layer in some of these biological options to fit some of those risk factors. 
So basics in terms of risk. Um, to start with, we need to identify the entry points that are available. So there are a range of different potential entries that we might have for Petritus to establish itself. And these are different scenarios that we need to address with our fungicide program, uh, incorporating biological fungicides along the way. So I've done a quick list of potential entry points, and this doesn't cover everything, but if you go from the top down, you've got a range of different scenarios where you might see um, Petritus establishing itself. So the classic is flowering. So we get cap release and we have um, a high risk for late infection to occur there. We also have scenarios where we might have stuck caps, uh, particularly in wet seasons. Stuck caps create uh, shelter on the berry surface, the immature berry surface where no fungicide is able to contact the surface of the berry. They're also a really good source of inoculum, keeping in mind that Petrotus is a, a necrotroph and so will colonise those dead pits of, of plant material quite well. If they remain inside the bunch, as the bunch develops and closes off, you've got a, a seeding event there that can then generate a further infection later in the season. Insect pressure is a big one. So any caterpillars or weevils that are creating damage points, these create entry and release of carbohydrates out of the immature fruit uh, or into the flowers. And that is another source for carbohydrates to allow the Petrotus to establish itself. What we do in terms of vineyard practices, practices can influence that too. So we have uh, just general wire lifts and, and leaf plucking manually or, or uh, with machine equipment. The shoot thinning and, and leaf plucking process can actually create entry points that allows Petrotus to establish itself. Uh, and I've listed canopy shaking there, which is a sort of a developing use pattern in certain scenarios as well. The impact of other diseases, so powdery mildew scarring, uh, downy mildew damage to the inflorescence can actually create solid entry points uh, and they can be good seeding sites as well for latent infection. And then we have the general development of the berries. And this is variety specific, but we tend to see micro scratches developing over the berry surface um, during that um, sizing of the berry. And these are good sources of carbohydrates. If the environmental conditions favor the Petritus, then we will see um, them as a, a potential risk for entry. And our split berries around rainfall events, late season, um, particularly as the berries thin out in their skins. So we have quite a lot of potential risk points that we need to cover off or think about when we're dealing with botrytis management. And these biological fungicides that we're going to talk about today, they all have uh, particular fits uh, across um, these different entry points, um, as well as for late season. So the key point here being that we want to be able to use these in uh, an, a, a developed strategy for botrytis management without just putting them at the very tail end of the season. So to our biologically derived fungicides, and I've said that specifically because uh, biologicals tend to be all lumped together in one big basket. And they are quite a diverse group and becoming more and more diverse. So um, the fungicides that we've got available commercially now for use, uh, there'll be a whole heap more coming in this space with different focus on a, a variety of different pathogens, um, some insect, uh, insect focused insecticides as well in this space. So it's important for us to understand just how diverse this group is and understand that not all the biologicals are specifically uh, organisms that are, are colonizing. So I've split these into two particular sections. So living organisms and extracts. Now the living organisms, uh, when you're buying a product that is a, a living organism, you're buying a spore suspension or you're buying a bacterial um, colony cluster effectively, and you're, you're using those as active colonizers. Okay, so this is something that's going to live, breathe and be put into the vineyard and, and function in the vineyard as a living organism. They tend to be quite good from a competitive uh, inhibition point of view, 
some of them are generating antifungal compounds along the way as well. Um, the couple of different examples that I've put there, trichodermas are being used a little bit here and there, although not registered for use in export wine. Uh, Botectors, probably the first of the biologicals to come into the Australian market and Seraphil. And I've highlighted those in red because we're going to talk about both of those products in a bit more detail with the company representatives. The extracts is an interesting space. So this includes plant eliciters or generally looking at products that are extracted out of um, perhaps a fermentation process or um, extracted directly out of plant material. And these are not living organisms so much. They're the, the antifungal compounds that are being generated. Uh, these can have uh, SAR effects as well as direct impacts on pathogens. So we've got one example of that here that we're going to talk in detail about, which is Serenade Opti. And there are a couple of other alternatives coming through here. And we'll touch on Intervene and Novellus as part of this discussion as well, but um, not in depth. The key here is to understand that not all of these products are designed to be used in exactly the same way as your conventional chemistry used to be, uh, the options that they're potentially replacing. So we have to understand each of the tools, their strengths, their weaknesses, any of the variables that are important for getting the best out of those particular products. And that's how we start the ball rolling in terms of positioning them into a, a program through the season. Oops, there we go. So when biological fungicides first came out, they, they also generally coincided with the removal of various uh, other traditional chemistry options that we'd, we would have used in programs before. So uh, Roverals, Captans, those types of products would have been taken out of export grapes around the same time. So these products were generally looked at as great gap fillers. They're going to be used in exactly the same way as the old chemistry. And they have a few bells and whistles around them in terms of um, um, upsides. And that's how they rolled out into the marketplace. As we've gone through a few years with commercial use of these products, we start to see a lot of the nuances around them, how we get the best out of each of the actives. Um, and it's important then to skip past perhaps the upsides and look at some of the, the more variable nature of these products um, so that we can get the best out of those products. So we talk about the biological fungicides as having low to nil residue profiles that allows you to use them quite late um, in your program without risk of contamination of wine. That's a big pro. Um, the problem with use of it really late is that you're not really using the product to its strength in a lot of cases. They tend to be IPM friendly and they're very good functional protectants. And I highlight the fact that they are protectants. So in each case, we're talking about using these ahead of infection events rather than looking at uh, positioning after we've got rampant botrytis active within the vineyard. So how do they vary from more commonly used fungicides? Uh, there are a couple of key things that we need to make sure we're doing right. Uh, with these products to get the best out of them. So identify that they have very limited or almost none uh, nil mobility. So where we place them generally is uh, where they're going to stay. There are some colonizing components in certain products that allow a bit more mobility around certain surfaces, but our base principle should be that these products don't move. And then if you are getting some colonization outward from the point of deposition, then fantastic. We still need to make sure coverage is, is absolutely the number one strategy, getting coverage across the target surface. Most of them don't bind very well. Um, they're little, nil or, or low binding uh, products. So you think of them as surface protecting fungicides um, and prone to wash off and variables like that. There are some situations in certain products where that changes. Um, some of these products, particularly the active living organisms, they need to have a spore load maintained in their canopy for specific windows. And we'll talk a bit more about that with, uh, with Seraphil and Botecta, about maintaining the spore load or targeting the entry point that it's trying to colonise uh, and not just relying on one application to do the trick. 
they tend to be quite short uh, or shorter in their persistence length. And that's a generalization because a lot of the environmental conditions that influence botrytis infection will also influence the persistence of these products. Um, so we need to be thinking more along the lines of shorter intervals rather than longer intervals. Um, and that's, again, a generalization depending on what's happening in the paddock in a given season. They're highly coverage dependent, um, a little bit more variable in control. So if we're a synthetic fungicide user, it's application set and forget for 14 days and then reapply something else. These can have a lot more variables in the success rate which they control. So you need to really understand each of the different products to find out how you're gonna use them uh, to greatest effect. And they can in certain situations be influenced by environmental factors that again, some of the synthetics don't really have an issue with. So important that we run through each of these and go through where their strengths and weaknesses are um, and what their modes of action are. What are we actually trying to achieve with each of these biological fungicides? So the other fact that I've listed there is that in the marketplace, I think there's, there's starting to become a groundswell of knowledge around the mode of action for each of the products, but we're still at a very low ebb. So we need to really build that that understanding like we do with any of the synthetics. So you know exactly what you're trying to do with a particular product and how that is gonna play out when you when you actually deploy it in the field. So common factors that generally influence, negatively influence the fungicides, the biological fungicides in the field. Um, coverage is number one out of this. So as I said before, with all of these biologicals, we wanna maintain really good coverage because what we hit is what we're protecting in most situations. So when we're dealing with, um, as I said before, the, the starting um, implementation of biological fungicides into viticulture was put these products as late as possible because they don't have a, res a residue profile to worry about. That's the hardest possible window to maintain good coverage. And it's also the highest expression rate of infection from earlier in the season. So whenever we're using these products, we want to make sure our sprayer is set up so that we can hit the target. Our water volumes are set up so that they can generate enough coverage across the surface. We're not compromising coverage based on water volume. And our canopy density allows us to access the fruit zone. And that's a big one for most production zones where biologicals are being used at the moment. Um, last season was a good example of that in Western Australia, where we had significant shoot growth, a considerable amount of leaf plucking required just because of the seasonal vari variation. And that, that generated a microclimate inside the canopy and also um, fairly decent shielding of the fruit zone itself. So we need to make sure that we're opening up the canopy and maintaining good coverage options for the biologicals to function effectively. Timing is a big one for success of biological fungicides. Uh, the focus on late season, these products certainly have a fit in the later part of the season, but they are equally functional and reliable when you bring them earlier in the season. In fact, in a lot of cases more so because they're protectants and because you're trying to solve a problem, uh, minim minimize risk uh, through quite an extensive period of growth development for the fruit. These products often work more effectively if you place them earlier in the program to protect against latent infection rather than trying to pull them back at the other end. So use of them late season has been one of those, uh, one of those negative uh, impacts on on the perception of biological fungicides, they can be used all the way through the program for specific functions. Uh, the intervals between treatments is another one that catches a lot of growers out. So and we'll deal with this with each of the products and we talk to the companies in a minute. But when we look at spray programs, historically, uh, we have very tight spray programs leading up to flowering, the cover flowering well, and then after that, when environmental conditions change, it gets a bit hotter and we have less rainfall in a lot of environments, we tend to see that the intervals between sprays drift out. So they might get to 14, even 21 days in certain environments for certain size production zones. 
So once that happens, you'll see that the performance of these products can actually be compromised if you're not actually paying attention to the environmental conditions that are going to influence Botrytis uh, establishing itself through those intervals. So we have to make sure that when we're using biological fungicides, we shorten or we target our intervals correctly around each of the products that we're selecting to use. Growth stage spraying plays a lot to do with that as well. So uh, the conversations when we first launched biologicals in a viticulture where, uh, so which particular growth stage does this product fit in? Is this an EL27 spray or is this an EL31 spray? Biologicals need to be used in a more adaptive fashion. So we need to be able to position them successfully into a range of different growth stages based on what's happening with the environmental conditions first and foremost rather than specifically targeting a growth stage. So that's one of the catches I think that many growers um, have a problem with. And then certain size properties and limited spray equipment or staffing issues can sometimes uh, reduce your flexibility to address the weather conditions. So if you're dealing with biologicals, and um, we see this a lot in organic production, you have to adapt to environmental conditions, you have to be able to position the products in a tighter window or stretch them out depending on what's going on. So if you've got a limited uh, ability to get across the ground and to tighten those intervals between sprays, then you can get a bit more variability out of biological fungicides than you would perhaps have seen with more synthetic options in the past. And I've just put here uh, the outcome. The outcome of your use of a biological fungicide actually is Quite, um, quite important, not only for your overall disease control, but your perception of biologicals moving forward. So where I've seen some really, um, I've seen some fantastic results of the use of layered biological programs and some pretty average ones where the topics that I've just covered above in coverage and timing haven't really been addressed. And you're left with this expectation that a late season application is going to solve the problems that were created with Petritus establishing earlier in the season. So it's important that we manage expectations for these products and use them to their strength. And then the growers at the other end will actually have a better outcome and a better perception about how these products work. So it does come down to understanding the mode of action to a large degree. So with that, I thought we would jump into the Q&A session just to deep dive into three of the products. So we'll talk about uh, Botecta, Serenade and Seraphil. Uh, the first on screen now is, is Botecta. Um, just so you can get a better understanding of how this product functions and some of the variables that you need to take into consideration around use pattern. Um, so we'll bring Matt Grattan into the conversation here. Um, the way I've set up this slide is um, some basic information and a few things that we want to talk through on the left. And then there's a, a sort of a traffic light signal on the, the right hand side, covering off many of those entry points that I talked about before. So these are potential scenarios where we might see use of the product. And in all three of the products that we're going to discuss, there are specific fits for, um, for all of those products in these when targeting these potential entry points. What I've done is left it as an orange. If there's a question mark that you really need to think about and anything that's got a, a, a green with a, a black circle around the outside, there are caveats as to whether you would use it there or not. Certainly functional products in those spaces, but there are sort of caveats that we need to think about before you decide which way you want to bend for the product. So Matt, um, Botect has been around for five years, six years in the marketplace. Um, it's Oreo obsidian, <coughs> excuse me, Oreo obsidian pollen. So it's a fungal organism, uh, a living culture. So it comes under that living division uh, and works by competitive exclusion. Can you explain that competitive exclusion a little bit? Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so like you mentioned, Botecta is a, a living organism and there's two strains of Oreo basidium pololans in the product. And when we talk about um, competitive exclusion, uh, Botecta competes for the same space and nutrients that uh, the Botrytis does. 
And if you think about it as a horse race, uh, Botecta is the fastest horse in the race. So Botecta can get in there and um, being a non-pathogenic organism, uh, will colonize those, those cracks in the, in the berries or uh, any wound sites, and it will just outcompete the botrytis. So it will colonize those sites faster and um, eventually just starve the botrytis spores by uh, excluding them from, from any food or uh, resources. So when we're using this, we're talking about getting it onto entry points when they're visible, correct? Um, so, yeah, I guess you can see the wound sites from, from flowers, but um, also micro scratches. So uh, you can't see the micro scratches, uh, which are also wound sites that the berries can be infected from. But um, yeah, definitely if you can see uh, wound sites from flowering or um, even when you have insect damage or um, a bit of marking from, from say powdery mildew scars or, or anything like that, the Botecta will get in there and seal those wound sites. An important thing that is often raised with uh, growers in the field with this product, um, once I've applied the product, will it then colonise other entry points outside of what was there at the time of spray? So you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of these products don't move and Botect is one of those. It, it, it will definitely colonise all the wound sites that it contacts, but any new wound sites that form um, post application, it, it won't colonise. I've seen that in a, on a regular basis when we've placed it into a, a scenario, you tend to get a percentage of control, quite useful control, but there is always another potential source that opens up afterwards that you can, you have to position this product in again to, to colonise and compete on. Um, what about conditions in terms of um, environmental conditions and how that influences colonisation rate? Uh, so Botecta, I guess the, the conditions that favour Botecta are also are the same conditions that favour botrytis growth. So uh, your temperature around that, I guess, 18 to 25 degrees, Botecta thrives really well there. So uh, having two strains of the Oreo Basidium pollens gives Botecta a wide pH range that it can survive in, but also a wide temperature range. So uh, anywhere from 18 to 35 degrees, Botecta will thrive and colonise. Uh, once it gets above that 35 degrees, it does start to slow down, but the, uh, the botrytis infection also starts to slow down after that as well. Humidity isn't a limiting factor, but it um, certainly plays a part. So if you have uh, high humidity above 70% relative humidity, the Botecta will uh, colonise even faster again. Um, certain things that you do need to pay attention to are um, uh, other chemistry, so being a living, breathing organism, um, contamination in the tank, so make sure your tank's been cleaned out really well. Um, and some of the uh, other chemistries that you might be looking at, like your, your broad spectrums, your chlorothalonils, um, not so much captan anymore, but certainly um, dithionon uh, will have an impact. Your group 11s and group 3s uh, definitely have an impact on, on the Botecta. So allowing three days either side of an application of any of those and making sure that your tank is really well cleaned out. So for this one, we're talking about coverage. We want to make sure there's good hygiene. Uh, a lot of the core fungicides, um, particularly anything that's targeting um, ascomycete fungal pathogens will be taken out by, uh, if you put them in the tank and contaminants can sometimes influence colonization rate. So. For this one, as is uh, said there in bold, we want to look at the speed of colonisation rather than traditional persistence. So as you said, it's a horse race. So we want to get colonisation to be concluded as fast as possible. Um, so we want to try and target this into what sort of environmental conditions, sort of sub 35 degrees, a little bit of humidity. Um, that's, that's where we're going to get the best overall control. Exactly right. If you get your coverage right and you have those good conditions, so um, a little bit of humidity and the temperature not too hot, uh, you get ideal um, conditions for colonisation and, and speed of colonisation is, is key. So we go across to the traffic light symbols here. Um, so there are a raft of different scenarios where we'd use Botecta as a, an option. 
Um, what I've done in this in these green cir uh, green circles with the black, I've just highlighted variables that might influence our, our practical use of a product like this. So um, colonizing entry points, the first three, it's pretty straightforward from what you've said there. That's it's an easy way of using the product. Um, post harvest shaking, canopy shaking. I've just flagged that as a, uh, it's certainly an option that's been used and been successful. But the caveat there, and, and the same will be the case with a lot of the other products that we're going to talk about. Um, in my view, it's about timing relevant to the damage. So if you, uh, you cause any berry damage through that shaking process, then you leave it for a week to 10 days before you actually go through and apply it, then you've got some limitations on what you should be expecting out of the product like Botecta. Fair call? Fair call. So I've actually got some really cool photos from some of that work that you're talking about there, Scott, um, where the Botecta has sealed off berries that have been cut in half and, and protected them. But um, yeah, that was applied soon after. So being a protectant, if there is an infection that gets in between that shaking or, or any other, I guess, wound site that's developed and the application of the Botecta, the Botecta won't control um, active infections. It, it's a pure preventative. And that's one thing that we have as a commonality through most of our biological fungicides. Uh, and I don't think it'll change with any of the new ones that might come through in the next few years. We want to make sure that you're as close to or contain, continually maintaining a barrier against botrytis establishing itself. We want to be in front of the infection development, not behind it. Um, the other ones that I put in here, there's a few that probably are common questions. Um, spraying Verizon in front of a rainfall event. Uh, spraying behind the rainfall event, which way do I go with some of these products? Um, we'll talk about it again in a minute with um, Serenade and Seraphil in the same boat. From my perspective, um, it very much depends on the environmental conditions that are loading up into your, into your uh, Verizon window in front of the rainfall, whether or not you have spore activity in the vineyard, uh, whether you're thinking you'll actually look at splitting later in the season. So, it's it's uh, it's not an easy one to select a product to place there. Um, you have to think very much about the conditions around that, uh, and likewise behind the rainfall event, are you expecting hot, dry weather to follow it? Um, how much of an infection event have you had? Uh, variables like that. Very split's an interesting one with Botecta because I think you can apply directly onto the split, but how long do you wait? to maximize the splitting of the berries after a rainfall event in order to make sure you're getting um, value out of the product. Um, for the most part, I, th I think I see this sort of product as a, a spray that you put on and it needs to be hitting whatever access points are there for the botrytis as soon as possible after the event. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get 100% control of botrytis. There will always be more splitting or um, subsequent entry points created as, as a result of the, the splitting process. Yeah, exactly right. And if the sugars are leaking out of those split berries and, and creating sites for the botrytis to um, feed upon, then yeah, you're not going to be able to control that. Uh, from, from my point of view, this and many of the other products have got really short with hold periods. Uh, so you can use them quite late if you had long hanging fruit um, I tend not to use Botecta into programs really late. If I'm talking about a um, five to say 10 day hang time and I just wanted to get some coverage on, I tend not to put Botecta into that space simply because I don't think there's enough time for it to really have an impact. Whereas um, some of the other alternative products I think probably have a, a, a more rapid impact on developing uh, botrytis. So. All right, um, we might jump off Botecta and go into, thanks Matt, um, go into Serenade thanks, Opti with Hugh. Right, Hugh, jump, jump on here. Howdy. Howdy. Uh, so Serenade Opti was a product that was launched, I think the year after Botecta, but has been around. 2018, I think, yeah. Uh, very popular in the market um, as a, um, Extract from a fermentation process, so it's Bacillus amylicophaciens. It comes into the 
uh, not a living colonizing product, but it's the ferment components, correct? Yeah, well that's right. yeah, so the product itself, uh, it's got the spores of the of the um, QST713 strain, but importantly, from a fungicidal point of view, it's um, made up of the lipopeptides, which is a, actually a blend, a group of uh, compounds and there's 35 of them in, um, in the product. And they're the ones that are doing the work, acting like a, like a protecting fungicide. So we often look at this as a product in the field, as a, a true barrier spray product. It's creating a barrier over the surface like we would with coppers or sulfurs. Yeah. We want an impenetrable barrier as much as we can, and that's going to impact on spore germination and mycelial growth? That's it, yeah. Early stages of the detritus, it's not, it, it's, uh, yeah, as you say, in the germination and early growth stage of the, of the disease. And so you want the product on before that spore lands on the surface. And um, we, we've got, um, yeah, probably there's a lot of knowledge actually on the moon of action on how this how this works it's mainly uh, disrupting the cell membrane so it bursts or ruptures the cell membrane of those developing fungal tissues it's not effective on the um, on the sporulating um, botrytis um, um, and uh, so yeah hence the protectant angle now, I think from a field perspective, that's where I, I think year of launch, actually, not so much anymore. I think most people have got their head around the product now, but in the year of launch, there are a few examples where it had been positioned directly targeting sporulating botrytis as a, a knockdown product to kill off uh, actively developing latent infection, which is nowhere near where we want to be positioning this product. Yep. Um, yep. So... In terms of length of activity, and I've always practically looked at this as about a 10-day lifespan, seven to 10-day, depending on what you've got in terms of environmental conditions, um, how high your pressure is for, um, for botrytis activity within the vineyard. So there's a lot of variables around that. It can be longer, it can be shorter. Um, when, given that sort of time frame, are we looking at a layered approach or single applications? How do you how do you see it best fit? Yeah, it's a good one, good question. And that ten days is probably not a bad estimate under under high pressure. Um, but we've seen also good results with a single spray applied um, thirty days before harvest um, and gotten really good results. Um, and it depends what's happening in that 30 days, doesn't it? So that's um, probably the, the, the caveat. Um, a lot of people have, have used it either once or twice, you know, starting at race on and working with the weather forecasts and um, uh, perhaps putting a second one on, um, you know, around that nine or 10 BOME mark and getting them through. So it's, you know, if you get a if you get a really wet uh, season, then then that interval interval and long longevity is going to contract. So it's very very difficult to put a firm number on. And, and I think that's the important um, one of the important points that I would reference for this product. Um, so, well, all the biologicals for that matter, you really need to be thinking about your environmental conditions first. And what does that do in terms of potential risk for your, your pressure of botrytis activity into the vineyard? And then think about how you're going to put your strategy together. So in this case, we might have a, a window, say, post-Christmas where there's rainfall events coming through fairly regularly, a little bit cooler weather or high humidity conditions. You've got a higher risk window. You should be probably putting in a layered approach of these products, whereas... If it's dry all the way through, when we're getting to Verizon, we can implement a protective strategy on the outside of the fruit rather than specifically looking at latent infection and we get really good results. Yeah. So quite a moving feast in terms of how we actually implement something like Serenade and it's very flexible in all different scenarios. So very useful from that point of view. Um, there's no issues with spray application. Um, 
compatibility or uh, any of those sort of variables with the product? No, not really, actually. Um, and that's often the, the questions we get is, uh, you know, what, what can we mix it with? And the, the main thing there is um, is that um, we can um, we can mix it with a big range of the fungicides and some insecticides as well, including copper and sulfur, which is a bit surprising. Um, but it's because uh, we, we're not relying on, you know, having to colonise with a live, live um, spore uh, mixture. So uh, the, the main issue, I suppose, or thing to remember is that it is a WP formulation and people need to mix that product into the tank first before adding anything else. But there's nothing that we've really found to be a problem um, in terms of compatibility or, or reducing the efficacy so that's um that's unusual but it's uh, it's what we found from from both here and the overseas work as well i guess because it's biologically derived and we're reliant very much on the lipopeptides from the ferment so it's more true chemistry effectively in the tank rather than uh the potential implications of a, a mixed partner impacting on the, the living organism right yeah that's that's the point yeah yeah okay um, in terms of what we've got listed off here in the traffic light um, table here, again, Serenade can fit across all of these targets for entry. Um, there's some pretty good ones, the late, late season applications where I've had really good results with this, equally so coming out the other side of fruit set. Uh, again, depends very much on how you place it against the environmental conditions. Um, if you've got insect damage points, I've used this product quite well in terms of um, covering those, those control windows. So if you're trying to take out light brown apple moth, applications of serenade over that process while you're removing it out can actually prevent you getting um, latent infection on those entry points quite well too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've left it as an orange for the post harvest shaking and, and predominantly because um, I've never really seen the product in that scenario, yeah. It's, to me, it seems yeah. like you need a colonizer more than something that's just going to give you a barrier, but it could be used in that space if you're uh, close enough to the damage. And I guess proximity to entry point development is a big one for this product, right? Yeah, um, it might be, a, might be a research question too, and you sort of might have to uh, wonder about the ability of the colonizing um, organisms on top of a green berry like that because um, you're doing that pretty early so yeah but we haven't tested that in that in that technique but um the, the um, principle is that the the um the surfaces that are that are uh, uh, applied upon are, are, are protected from a new new source of infection so that's that's the way i sort of want to think about it and that comes back down to this, uh, the last one that was third one from the bottom there, the berry split conversation. Yeah. Uh, when we're treating with serenade and berry splitting takes place, the outside of the berry is, is well protected from a barrier application prior to the split, but opening up that entry point, that entry point is a brand new entry site. So that's not protected, correct? He froze there a bit. Hopefully I didn't freeze. I can hear you, so I think it might be Hugh. It might be Hugh. All right. So if we were looking at Serenade Opti into this space and we had um, splitting occurring, your coverage across the surface of the berry is going to be intact. The new entry point that's being created by the split won't be protected and therefore an application over the top of that is is ideal um, from my perspective i think you probably would agree hopefully um, the colonization rate of botrytis onto that split is going to be rapid uh, from creation of it so the best results as we've said before with serenade opti are where we place this into early development stages of the botrytis so we can get it on nice and close and a good coverage across that split. You can actually get pretty good control. Um, all very much depends on how close you are to the infection uh, position and how long you leave it and what the environmental conditions are doing post your split or your rainfall event that's causing that split. 
Hopefully I've covered that off all right in Q's absence. She's back now, I think. Uh, we might just move on. Um, very effective product that can give you a lot of control if you know how to use the product. Might jump into Mark, if you want to jump on Mark. Thanks, Scott, I can't get the video on. That's all right. It's been, been blocked on your end. On my end? That's the message. Hmm. I don't know how to unblock it. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Anyway, we'll, we'll just okay. talk about the product. That's not a problem. You can hear me? That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Seraphil is another of the commercially available products probably out two years into the market, something like that. Uh, yes. Bacillus amylicophacians again. So same basic uh, organism, I guess, as what we talked about with Seraphil, but a very different strain. So it has, has, uh, fits into that living category of, of botrytocides. Um, so it's a living culture. Um, do you want to talk about how this one works a little bit, Mark? Sure. So, yes, uh, it is a bacillus strain, um, a different strain to, to serenade. Um, the difference here is that we, Seraphel is a pure washed spore formulation. So it's dormant spores only no metabolites or anything else. Um, in mixing it in the spray tank, you, the water contact with water activates the, the spores. It's then sprayed out and generally humidity overnight is enough to, to get those spores growing. In, in that growing process, um, the main mode of action is the production of two waste products, two metabolites, um, arturin and surfactant. And those are the, the, the two um, waste products which are giving you the, the predominant activity on the, um, the fungal cell. Like serenade, it needs to be on preventative, it needs to be on leaf or the berry before the fungal spore lands. Uh, very important. The way, the way I explain it, it's like sun cream. So you put sun cream on before you go out in the sun, putting it on afterwards, uh, you will not pull back that, that sunburn um, as part of that analogy. So in the, same, in the same manner, if you've put sun cream on and you go for a swim, you come out, you need to reapply. Um, so it's something important with Seraphel, you're spraying the pure spore, it then grows, creates these waste products. Um, there's also competition and um, all that sort of stuff on the, on, on the leaf but it really needs to be on in that preventative space before the infection occurs. So this is one of the biologicals that I referenced before. We're talking about the, the differences between traditional chemistry. This one actually will colonize across plant surfaces, but um, you still need to treat it as if it's not doing that process. So your coverage is still really critical, correct? Absolutely. So yeah, I'll come back to that sun cream analogy every time. What you don't cover, consider it unprotected. Yeah. So coverage is absolutely key, um, as with you know, the, the other products as well. So we're generating a layered approach with this product. It's got a, on the label, again, this is one of those question marks that comes up on a regular basis when we're talking Seraphil with, with growers is uh, the label says a respray interval of about three to 14 days. Uh, which is quite a big gap in terms of uh, how you would actually treat this in the in the field. Um, we talk about a seven day being the ideal. Again, this comes back to the environmental conditions. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of um, what happens in terms of mortality of cells for this product? So we, we, we're spraying a, a living spore. It's dormant. It, it uh, starts growing. Um, as with any living organism, there's a natural... Uh, level of mortality or decline in the numbers. Um, we've got data to suggest, you know, that after seven days, 20 to 25 percent of those spores have died off just through natural mortality. So the conversation there is, if you're losing numbers slowly over time, it's just bumping it up again. And this is where this layered or, um, you know, a couple successive application uh, conversation comes in, in bumping those numbers back up to levels. Um, that give you that, that efficacy that you, you're after. So is that real protective yes. 
bar barrier again, though, isn't it? So similar sort of concept to what we do with Seraphil. Um, so, well, a little bit different to Botecta, but we're creating a barrier around the surface. And if we can maintain that barrier, then we have functional protection against infection. Correct. And se seven days is, is probably the sweet spot. Um, you know, 14 days in real dry conditions, low disease pressure, uh, yep. three days in, in real high uh, pressure systems. And again, as you've said, environmental conditions is, is the key. So let's talk about those environmental conditions briefly. So temperature has an impact, humidity has an impact. What's the scenario there? We're spraying a dormant spore, so pretty unaffected by, by temperature um, in terms of mortality or killing the, uh, the spore. You know, temperatures are 45 degrees, uh, no, no impact on the spore. Obviously, it impacts how the spore grows. So the similar conditions, as, as Matt said earlier, conditions that favour botrytis growth will favour the cerephal spore growth, which means more metabolites. Um, that 25 to probably the mid 30s is, is that sweet spot. Um, humidity, humidity overnight um, is ample to get these cerephal spores going. So um, yeah, like I said, that, that mixing in the water tank, uh, in the spray tank activates those spores and brings them out of that dormant phase. So. What about uh, other impacts in terms of uh, fungicides that are being used, residues on the, the canopy of the fruit? Uh, anything in the tank that's going to impact on survival of the spores or do we also have to worry about things like major rainfall events impacting on spore survival? So a number of points in terms of uh, mixes with other chemicals, um, fairly similar to, to Hughes product, wide range of uh, insecticides, fungicides that you can mix uh, those spores with. They, they, they're fairly bulletproof. Um, when it comes to compatibilities, it's, it's often what you're not compatible with. It's, it's more the conversation than what you are compatible with. Yeah. Um, Seraphil, we know, stay away from polyram mixes, Bravo, and any Mancozeb or Mancozeb based products. So it's so predominantly it multi sites, yeah? The multi sites, yeah. Everything else, the coppers, sulfurs, as you said, uh, no problem. Three, sevens, group 11s, no issue at all. So it's a very compatible. Excellent. In terms of rain fastness, uh, very rain fast, we, uh, we would be happy with three hours um, and accept that it's pretty rain fast. Uh, soft rain or drizzle or mist uh, thereafter would actually reactivate those spores, so very beneficial. Obviously, you know, heavy thunder shower type rain, you do lose a portion of the product off, off the leaf, absolutely. So we had a decent downpour of, say, 10, 15 millimetres of rain over the course of a day. We put this out in front of the rainfall event to have an impact throughout the, the actual event itself, or would we do it later? I do both, one before and one or two after. Uh, yep. Stay in the preventative um, phase. You know, don't give any dormant spores, uh, uh, botrytis, um, you know, the opportunity to get going with, with that rain and then just clean it up to sprays afterwards, so that layered approach again. Okay, and the discussion that we had the other day around the Verizon applications that you were sort of implying that putting it out in front of a rainfall event was actually probably the, the ideal scenario for the product in terms of um, that particular window. Can you just, um, so this is not affected by temperature, so we can put it out in front of the rainfall event, have it sitting dormant, and then they activate with the rain or humidity that's coming with the rainfall event to stop the infection taking place. We still need to think about the post rainfall event as a secondary application. Absolutely. And, and you know, as we said, um, you often get those real hot uh, temperatures in front of in front of a rainfall event. You're working with a pure spore here. So, you know, pretty, <clears throat> pretty robust. Um, no issue in putting it out in front of a rainfall event in 45 degrees. Um, as long as it's sitting there, before that rainfall event and then possibly follow up thereafter. And as with the other products that we've talked about already, it's proximity to the actual in, um, entry point creation that we really need to be thinking about with our control strategy. So where we've got a window where there's quite likely to be infection, many of these different entry points are created through insect pressure or something else happening in the vineyard. And we wanna put this into a layered approach over that period where it's potentially going to be colonised or the fruit's going to be colonised by botrytis, correct? Correct. 
and that's always the challenges we've discussed with berry split you know you you could probably spray the next day and get you know most of the vineyard there's always going to be a piece that you won't get coverage on and you know these products don't pull pull infections back uh, after after the fact so yeah so and i think that's a common theme across all the biological products is that you need to manage expectations to some degree and that these are not uh, heavy hitting knockdown options. These are really good protecting options that can mitigate population development more than directly influence the development of the disease once it's in full flight. So we want to be positioning them around weather events, whichever product or combination of products we're selecting, we want to place them around the right conditions relevant to what's happening in the season rather than pre-programming them into a program. All right. Um, I think that's all we needed to talk about for Seraphil. Uh, I was just going to talk briefly about two other alternative options and then we can probably get into the Q&A session to, to some degree as well. Um, thanks, Mark, for that. So there are other alternative biologicals that are available, um, imminently available, I suppose. Uh, Novellus is available now in the marketplace and uh, I just raise it as another alternative mode of action to show the diversity that happens within this biologicals group more than anything else. So we won't deep dive into this one, but uh, a very interesting, unique product that can impact on, um, on Botrytis as well in key windows through flowering at the moment and uh, hopefully into the future into, into other production windows. So another way of impacting on mycelium and spore activity within the, in the crop. Uh, and intervenes another alternative space here. Again, this, these are both products that are extracts or coming off of a ferment um, from a, a biological source, very effective product and intervene that'll be out next year as another alternative rotation tool to go in conjunction with the existing ones that we've just talked about. So there are plenty of these different alternative biologicals. Um, my key thing for all of these is to make sure that we're looking at these uh, closely in terms of their mode of action and thinking about it in reference to the disease and what's happening in the field in any given season for a specific block. So be adaptive and think about how these products will work for you rather than looking at them as late season fixed problem type scenarios. So Marcel, perhaps we might just um, jump into any questions that have come online through the session at that point. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, also, thanks to you, Mark and Matthew for participating so far and please hold on because we've got some more questions. Um, so I will open it up to questions from our audience. Please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar in the bottom of your screen, type in your question and then click send if you have one. So we do have some questions already coming through, which I will now just read out. So a question around Serenade Opti at flowering. Um, would you tank mix it with standard flowering chemistry, say at 80% cap four, or would the product be okay to stand alone in this space? So you, I think that sounds like a question for yeah. you. Uh, thanks, Matt. I'm sorry about uh, dropping off. Um, thanks for uh, to NBN for that one. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think I would... Um, mix them with uh, synthetic uh, overflowering. I'd probably spread the timings. Um, and look, we've, we've, we've uh, got a, quite a lot of organic uh, growers who are using Serenade Opti at flowering as their key um, option and that, they're happy. So um, yeah, it's not, if given the choice under a conventional system, I'd still probably use the conventional chemistry at, at flowering and then utilize the, the serenade later, but um, th that option's still there, right? Yeah, and I mean, there are, again, there are lots of different ways in which you can position these products in through flowering windows if you're an organic producer. So, it comes down, in my view anyway, as to what's going on through that flowering and the lead up to flowering. Um, Serenade's been used in that flowering window for organic production. So is Botecta very successfully. Um, you could use these as alternatives as a bridging option early season for longer flowering 
intervals or um, or even behind the flowering option for conventional chemistry usage as well. So they're very, very flexible in terms of what you can use. And I think these biologicals actually stand out as into the future, potential mixing partners as well, um, depending on the type of product it is and, and what you're trying to achieve in terms of managing population selection down. Thanks, Scott, and thanks, you. Um, a question for Mark about Cerafel. How long does Cerafel take to produce the metabolites? So from application, um, generally, if you sprayed it uh, midday or afternoon, as we said, that uh, water in the tank mix activates it. Um, humidity that evening, um, it, it would be starting as soon as that. So as the product grows, um, metabolites are produced, um, conditions favoring quicker growth, uh, you know, quicker production of metabolites. So uh, within, within 24 hours, safely. And Mark, the, the other caveat there, I guess, is if it's, you still have to maintain that barrier, that concentration of of serifil actively growing on the surface of the fruit in order to maintain that concentration of the lipopeptides being generated. Correct. So, um, as we said, there's a natural natural mortality and decline. So, you want to get it on and then keep those levels up. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's just how it works. So, it's that again that sun sun cream analogy is is constantly reapplying and keeping that barrier before the fungal spore lands uh, on that leaf or, or fruit. Thank you, Mark. A uh, question about sprayer pressure during application. Does that play a role? And I guess that's a question to each of the panelists. I'll go I first, uh, just because I'm on. Um, so we've tested Cerafel at 10 times the maximum spray pressure of equipment we know in, in, in use at the moment. So yeah, you've got a dormant spore, um, virtually bulletproof, um, yeah, 10 to 20 bars, absolutely no issue at all uh, with the Cerafel spore. And with the Serenade Octi, there's no, no issues at all under the commercially Used um, pressures and systems, and and we're um, we're not concerned about um, bursting of spores or endos endospores at all anyway. So that's that's not a not a drama. And same with Botecta, no issues with with spray pressure. Um, as long as you're getting good coverage, yeah, use use whatever pressure you are, are comfortable with. It's, it's an important question, though, to ask when you're dealing with any of the biologicals moving forward. The three we've talked about today are pretty robust. But every time you pick up a new product in this space, make sure you're asking that question because certain products will have issues with spore survival if they're living um, when they're applied through high-pressure situations. So keep that one in the back of your mind when you're picking up a new product anyway. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I've got a question about Trichoderma hartianum, Scott. Uh, what about products for botrytis in that mix? Yeah, very effective. Uh, there's a, a decent product in the market. It's been used for a few years um, based on uh, winery allowance only. So it has to come through the winery and the winery's got to approve it before it can be used because it's not technically a registered option. Um, for export grapes. They're very effective products that target botrytis, uh, can be used in different slots as well. Um, environmental conditions can play a part of, uh, with that one. And uh, you can also have influences from, um, and it's a good example of one of those products where you do have to worry about your, your nozzle output and pressure for survival of the mother spore. So uh, very effective options. I've used them in programs before where we've used some of the other alternative options we've talked about today in conjunction with that, and they work very, very well. But you have to think about the environmental conditions you're using, Amanda, because it's not necessarily the same game uh, in Southern Margaret River as it would be 
somewhere in a warmer environment, for example. I will add a point that there are no registered with the APVMA, that's our pesticides and veterinary medicines regulator, any of these products for use in as a petriticide. Um, it's an issue for us in the sense that we do like for any products that are used um, for pest and disease control to have at least gone through a fermentation and wine quality study uh, and also to have gone through the APVMA regulatory process because there are checks and balances that they put in place that the wine industry relies on um, to ensure that you know the quality of our wine is is at a is at the highest standard so a few other issues to consider there it's Thank also you. it's a good point you raised to myself because when we go through and register something with the APVMA, there's a full-on tox evaluation that has to happen, proper assessment of uh, off-target um, risk, uh, hazard assessments, all sorts of things have to happen to tick the box. So, and while these are fairly inert sort of products, they, they still should be in that position to be assessed properly. And then the end users using it safely for the environment as well as for themselves. Thanks, Scott. Um, another one for you. What about mutualistic and or synergistic behaviours between standard multi-site fungicides and the biostimulants? Uh, big question. There are a lot of uh, synergistic interactions that happen between uh, multi-site fungicides and conventional chemistry options. And I think we'll see the same thing with some of these uh, biologicals when we start mixing them together. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a moving target at the moment, but it will it will be something that we'll see more and more of. I know that there's biostimulant work being done in um, in layered programs through Europe at the moment, uh, with some pretty interesting results coming out of it. But we just have to pressure test it properly and and understand what's really happening before we we go down that path. Thank you. I think this is for you as well because we don't have anyone from SIPCAM. Um, do you know the organic status of Novellus? Uh, the question is, I believe two of the terpenes um, are artificial versions, not plant extracted. Yeah, so I think the, um, to answer on behalf of, of SIPCAM, the Novellus product doesn't have an Australian registration for organics. It is certified elsewhere in the world, depending on exemptions and things like that. Um, two of the terpenes, are, I think, uh, are generated just from straight plant extract that the other one would have been, but is quite expensive to, to develop. So they've got one synthetic terpene and two that are um, uh, just plant extracts. And, and so therefore uh, under our system at the moment doesn't, doesn't rate as an organic status. Thank you, Scott. A question, are these biological controls specific to botrytis only, or can they be used for early season controls for other fungal diseases? Might be one for the panel if um, the products control any other fungal diseases. Yeah, I can make a comment there. We, we've certainly made observations on other important fungal diseases, but we don't have any uh, label claims and um, we, we we'll probably leave it at that, but it's um, yeah, it's certainly worth pursuing. Um, and you can see elsewhere that um, uh, there's other other diseases, like for example, on our our Serenade Opti label, we we have uh, claims for bacterial diseases and and uh, anthracnose as well in other crops. So there, there is some broad spectrum against um, some other uh, pathogens, but we haven't done the the uh, the label work for for grapes. And you see here also, uh, and I guess with and Mark is also the same sort of thing. Some SAR effects on other targets as a result of the use of those sort of products in crop. But um, I guess it depends on on how much of an effect that's going to be, right? Yeah, in the faint response ones are not as easy to measure either. No, yeah. a lot of variables associated with them. Scott, can you just clarify what SAR effects are? Systemic acquired resistance, or in certain cases, it's a localized acquired resistance, depending on what happens. So effectively, you're generating a plant, you're stimulating the plant to defend itself to some degree, activating um, pathways within the plant that can then defend against certain pathogens. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question. Is it best to stick to one of these products or have a mix throughout the spray program? 
I well, from my point of view, I always do a mixture of different products depending on their strengths and what I'm looking at in the field. So it, it kind of depends on what you're seeing in your particular vineyard as to how you want to approach it. Um, some of the better programs that I've seen operate have had Botecta and Serenade, um, have had a combination with trichodermas in certain scenarios, off-label, granted, but still. Um, so I, I don't think it's a case of picking one product as such. I think it's a matter of working your environmental conditions and figuring out how you're going to compete against the pathogen to greatest effect. So I'd, I'd be looking at a layered approach with different options when they needed. Thank you. These sprays are antifungal actives. Uh, what do they do to yeast and MLF bacteria in winemaking? Hugh, you want to start? Oh, yeah, we, we've done the studies there to show that there's been no negative impact on, um, on uh, either primary ferment or, or um, wine quality and also the malo. Uh, as well, so yeah, we've we've covered those bases for Serenade Opti. Can I go, Mark? On that, yeah, yeah, much the same. It's um, I don't think we'd have a product in the space if if there was an impact. So um, yeah, the work's all been done, and and same as you, no negative negative impacts to 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 worry about. And same as Mark and Hugh, no negative impacts. Um, Botec is actually aerobic, so as soon as it's, um, I, I guess, turned into juice, it's killed, um, doesn't survive, and alcohol also kills Botec. So yeah, no, no issues at all. Thanks, everyone. Uh, question here: Botec is kept in a reseller fridge for storage. So good that you're on there, Matt. How long from reseller to farmer to spray tank until the product isn't optimal? Uh, so it's kept in the fridge because uh, that gives us 30 odd months of um, shelf life. Uh, uh, below 20 degrees off the top of my head is about 10 months. Um, but you've got plenty of time to get it from, from the retailer to the spray tank and, and spray it out. It's, yeah, it's not as if it's going to uh, perish within uh, a day or a week. Um, I would say though that don't don't leave it in the hot ute if it's going to get up to about fifty or sixty degrees inside that ute. But um, other than that, you should be fine taking it from the retailer to the spray shed and, and using it. I think a lot was made of the uh, refrigeration storage for that product from launch, but where it's being used practically, it's just for long-term storage in a fridge. If it's being treated correctly, um, there's no issue just taking it out and, and bringing it to room temperature or over the course of the day, even just putting it out and, and working with it in the field. It's, it's a lot more robust than I guess was first thought of. Yeah, exactly right. We've had a question here from an organic producer. Could a reference chart be developed as to compatibility of presented products with copper and sulfur? Sure. Yeah, I think um, all of the products have got plenty of field testing and reliable data from each of the companies as to what the compatibilities are for organic producers. So I, I can't imagine that would be a hard thing to put together. Thank you. Perhaps email to that person who queried that, email the help desk and we can look at getting that information out to you. So helpdesk at awri.com.au. Uh, another question, do conventional fungicides, fluazinam, suppress polyoxin D if they are layered in earlier in the program? So polyoxin D was the new product, Scott, if you want to talk to that. No, they don't. Oh, you can answer it, Scott. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, conventional fungicides and, and polyoxin D are fairly compatible. There's, uh, I guess, New Pharma be doing a bit more development work on this in terms of compatibility moving down the line, but um, there shouldn't be any real concerns or red flags there at the moment, I wouldn't have thought. No, I haven't come across any watch outs for, um, for Intervene at all. Yeah. 
So keep in mind the, the polyoxin D is, a, is not a living component. It comes off a fermentation of a bacteria. And so you, you've got an active stabilised by zinc salt. Um, it, it's, it would only be something maybe to do with the zinc salt if there was a question at all um, about compatibility. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty compatible with everything that's been tested so far as I know anyway. Thank you. Uh, I've got a comment here that registration is happening for trichoderma. Yep. Got another quote, which is good. Uh, another question, are Serenade or Seraphel antagonistic to Botecta? It's a good one. Um, yeah, only, by the only by the nature that they come from different companies. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, we have, I don't think we've tested that in in our um, in our uh, system, but um, uh, there's probably people that have used both in a program that um, could comment. I don't know. Uh, I yeah, think I'm not aware of any work uh, together. Maybe successive one after the other, but not not together. Yep. Yeah, and the only the only practical explanation for it, the there is some restrictions about what it can do in the tank if they're active and they're, they're antifungal components. So I don't think I'd be putting them together. I'd be doing them in sequence just to be on the safe side. Do you have any comment on that, Matt? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. I um, Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, I imagine a, a layered approach would probably give you a better result anyway. I think if you... Trying to mix them together. From memory, the biofirm uh, evaluation data set actually had something about serenade. I'm not sure about Seraphil. Pretty sure serenade wasn't compatible, but um, that could be something we actually follow up with and Matt could follow up with and, and just confirm what's happened internationally. Um, all of these products have been used internationally for a while. So um, there'd be more information available on, on that sort of mixing component. Yeah, I'll chase that up. I suppose it also depends on whether that the question is thinking about in the tank or in the paddock? Yeah, well, so in the paddock, perfectly fine. In the tank, that's the question mark we'd have to answer. But um, I practically would probably be sequencing them anyway in a, in a, to give me the best overall control of botrytis infection. So um, we have, so it was about, the question was actually about the paddock. So thanks, Scott. And yeah. you and everyone for answering that one. Uh, we've got a question about the use of wetting agents and are there any issues to increase coverage? Good question. I'll go with Seraphel. Um, compatible, not required. Uh, what, would you use one um, if you're worried about coverage and trying to get better coverage with thick canopies? Absolutely use one no negative impact on the product. It can be used standalone without one, but certainly if you're after better coverage, um, you know, thick canopies, all that sort of stuff, absolutely consider using one. Yeah, I'd echo that, Mark, thank you. And I will also echo that, um, yeah, not, not required, but um, it, they can be mixed with Botecta. Um, Botecta also forms a saccharide, so it's, I guess it's a similar to its own built-in wetting agent. The, the, only, the only additional comment I'd add to that would be around maybe Botecta. Um, so we're talking about wetting agents, not oils, um, and, and certain products can actually antagonise Botecta's colonisation rate because they, they can suffocate the organism on the surface. So... Um, for the general, as a general rule, no problem, but with certain products, be careful and also take into consideration any of those adjuvants that have got an alcohol base to them. That's not something that you'd want to use with a, a protector. No, the alcohol will kill them. Thanks, guys. So we also had a couple of questions through the chat. Uh, one was uh, directed to you, you about Serenade, and I guess it also applies um, to the other to the other presenters there about adding food to the to the mix so that you could make it persist for longer. You talked about it requiring um, a food source in order to survive. Could that be built into the formulation? I think that's where the question's going. Are we not, talking not really, about the product there. Yeah, not not really a requirement for serenade because the 
we're uh, just relying on the uh, the metabolites which are which are already in the product. So um, that might be one more for Cerafil. I'm not sure. Yep. We're quite happy that a Cerafil spore will find enough nutrition on a, a leaf or or, or um, fruit surface to you know to, to germinate and grow sufficiently without the requirement of a, an additional food source. Um, I, I don't think it, it it would be required. Probably isn't going to have a major impact on on that natural mortality of the cells anyway, is it? So no, no. You, you're still going to have to do the reapplication in order to create the barrier, regardless of having excess food sources. And take yeah. it into consideration as well that they're, they're colonising on the leaf surface on any carbohydrates and food sources they can find there already. So there's yeah. there's plenty of food in a canopy. It's it's the natural progression of of serifil that you need to make sure you're up, upgrading the, the colonisation rate. Or colon they're, not dying, they're not dying because of a lack of food, let's put it no. that way. Yeah, yeah. And we just had one more one more question, just a clarification, Scott, about the traffic light system and the the green and the and the orange. Was the orange a red a red flag, or was that just no, no, just um, yeah. All of these products can be used in all of these scenarios in that traffic light system. The orange is just probably where there are variables that might. Well, you certainly would want to actually think about whether it's it's worth doing it specifically to target that that particular entry point. So all fine to use right the way through. There's, there's just some variables that you need to take into consideration to make sure you're getting the best out of the product in those situations. Thanks Sorry. very much. Sorry, Sorry, Marcel, there was one other question that I that I clicked on that's gone, I think, but it was about um, water quality. Oh, yes. Um, and um, were there any water quality issues or, or um, uh, things to, to be be concerned about with any of the products, I think was the nature of the question. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if I can start, because it might be different um, for each product, but with, with Serenade Opti, uh, the, the main thing is um, pH uh, needs to be between four and a half and eight and a half. So it's quite a big range. Um, and there's no other real, real issues in terms of water temperature or or um, hardness as such as normal uh, spray uh, spray water that would be used would be fine. Thank you. Serifel, yeah. fairly similar. I'd say pH uh, 5.8 to, to around 7, so slightly on the acidic side is optimal, but um, pretty robust you know, in a wide range of pHs, hardnesses, all that sort of stuff. The sweet spot would be just just under um, slightly on the acidic side. And for Botecta, um, pH isn't a worry, but uh, yeah, we do say don't uh, use warm water. And I think that was based on the, some of our European data. So that they were using quite warm water up above 25 to 30 degrees. So we, we don't recommend you use warm water uh, and high chlorine levels. Um, would be the only other watch out, but other than that, no, no real issues with standard spray tank water. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Scott, you, Mark, and Matthew. If we haven't got any other questions, we'll we'll keep going. Um, so thank you for providing important insights today into the biological sprays. I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of the session. I would also like to thank the audience for joining in and taking part. We appreciate all those questions that you've asked. And I'd like to remind you that as always, you will receive a link to view the recording of this presentation at the AWRI YouTube channel. The next AWRI webinar is on breeding and evaluation of new multi-resistant wine grape varieties for Australian conditions, which is being held on the 21st of October. If you would like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.